Hi, Laura. Hi. How are you? I'm good. I, uh, I don't know that I've ever met you. My name's Jonathan. Hi. Hi. I am a friend of Bob and Sylvia's. Oh, and, great. And of course, Bobby through, through them from years ago when I was a student at Andrews. Oh, wonderful. Well, welcome. Yeah, Bobby should be on in just a few minutes here. So sure. glad you could join us. Thank you. Yeah, what? just Bob and um, Coach and Sylvia just called me last Sabbath and we got reconnected. It's oh, been nice. It's been a long time <laughs> since we talked to them. Yeah, well, that's good. Where, where are you living now? Northern Wisconsin by oh. Lake Superior, way up north. Wow. <laughs> So. This has been a lot of fun. We get people from all over. We've had people from Hawaii, of course, and sure. Wisconsin, and yeah, good, good. Sure. So, where are you from? I am currently in Oregon, and um, yeah, I lived uh, actually up in uh, Colville where uh, Bob and Sylvia and Bobby live right now. I lived there for a couple of years and spent time doing ministry with Bobby, so. Sure, yeah. Hi, Tracy. Hi. Hello. I recognize those little ones. <laughs> that one. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> oh, goodness. Has it really been that long since I've seen you guys? <laughs> it has. Look at this. I know. Another one. You guys just don't have any quit in you. <laughs> we might have some break in us for a while. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there it is. Five is getting a little up there, you know. Yeah. Starting to reach the limit. <laughs> We're going to start watching more TV. I didn't say limit. I just <laughs> said we need a little break. <laughs> Give it a couple years at least. <laughs> Only God knows our limits. There you go. 
That's how we've been living. Hey, John, can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. I don't know if I'm unmuted. Yeah, you are. Thanks for everything you're doing to make this possible. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Can you hear me? <laughs> Thank you for all you're doing to make it, to make it, to make it possible. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm happy to, happy to do it for sure. I look forward to it every week. Awesome. Awesome, me too. Well, Bobby just texted me wondering which link it was, so hopefully he's finding it soon and <laughs> will be joining us. <laughs> Funny. John, if yeah. he doesn't, John, I know you can do it. <laughs> well, <laughs> I have no idea what the agenda is for tonight, so I would be oh. uh, having to do my own thing, I guess. So, but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's coming on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what we're doing, huh? I set a variety of stuff, so he don't want to post. I think it'll be a continuation of the March of the 144,000. Um, let's see here. You said something about Matthew 24. Is that? Yeah, yeah, Matthew 24. 
<sighs> Is that you, Barb? Yep. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, now. <laughs> Sometimes I recognize your voice. <laughs> Jenny, do you do you kind of hide behind the camera there? <laughs> I see Richard once in a while. <laughs> he, he's sitting in front and I'm over here on the side taking notes. Gotcha. <laughs> we're, looks like we're mostly just staring at their ceiling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm not a camera person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, um, we're starting a project down here. So the walls are literally Coming down around. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. But I'm trying what, to. What are you in the basement? Yeah. Oh, huh. I have to I have to be in the basement because uh otherwise the kids are well sometimes they come down here anyway, but <laughs> <laughs> otherwise they're a lot of times they're competing with the sound. If I want to say something, there's a lot of background noise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh goodness, Bobby! Just for a moment there, your your mother was a floating head over your shoulder <laughs> because of the background. <laughs> You're helping me with technical difficulties. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, we were enjoying lunch too much. Lost track of time. Then couldn't seem to get my computer. I had to reboot it. But uh, keep going. Keep chatting. I'll I'll be back. I'll be back in like one minute. Hold on. Okay. So Jenny, we had we had a friend come and help us put in an egress window right here. Oh wow. Does that let a little bit of light in? Natural light. Jenny left for a minute. But oops, I guess we'll tell her later. <laughs> so, uh, Bob and Sylvia, do you guys recognize uh, that uh, Laura Hawkinson is on with us? Do you see her in the list? <laughs> Yeah. Can you hear me, Laura? Hey, happy Sabbath. <laughs> hey, same to you. We're told to use Zoom. We, we're not sure where all the buttons are. We're pushing different things happen. Are you in your living room? Or... No, I'm, I'm upstairs in the office. Oh, okay. Joe and the kids are out canoeing. Oh, that's good. Yeah, so you got Joe working away out there. Well, he gets he gets cabin fever if he stays in. To see you. Did you get introduced to everybody yet? 
No, not, no, not yet. Well, let's see, we got to do introductions around again today. That'd be a good thing. Laura, Laura's a friend of ours from way back in Michigan when we used to, we were, I was just starting learning all this stuff. So uh, I hear that she uh, preaches this gospel regular now. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So uh, maybe everybody go around real quick and say your name, unmute your mic, say your name and what state you're currently living in. I'll go ahead and start. Uh, my name's uh, Jonathan Mayheron. I'm uh, in Oregon and uh, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> I'm Barb Panata, and I'm also in Oregon. And your specialty? Um, my specialty? I, I don't know. <laughs> my prof uh, my profession is veterinary. Are you a surgeon? I'm a veterinarian, yeah. I do surgery, too. Surgery, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. Go ahead. Everybody else, pipe up. Hey, Tracy. You had your oh, <laughs> I think I'm on. Can you hear me? Hello. Uh, I'm Tracy Costella. I'm from Washington. And your specialty? My specialty? Uh, banana bread and puppies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Lori Banfi. I live in Washington State. And uh, I am so surprised to see Laura Hokinson on here because I was good friends with her sister in law. Mm -hmm. wow. And, um, Very small. Oh, Good cool. To see you. Yeah. Good to see you too. Chris and Elizabeth from Washington. That's Laura. That's Lori. Lori. It's a fancy hat she's got. My name is Denise Harwood. I am Amber Lopez's sister. I live in Oregon. Hmm. Yeah, there's a couple more that didn't pipe up yet. We're just giving them a minute here. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. I'm actually in my car driving home from work. <laughs> Uh, my name is Shady, and I work. Uh, I'm in Oregon, and I I work with Barb. Mm -hmm. That's her. No, that's Lori Banty. Oh, I'm the big guy. See, we did. It. Anybody else didn't pipe up yet? It's Chris and Elizabeth, can you guys hear us? Yeah, we yeah we got you, Chris. How you doing? Good. From Washington. Well, I think that might be everybody. Anyway, just good to have everybody sort of introduce each other and find out that some of you know each other, Laura and Lori. <laughs> That's cool. Well, uh, yes, we're very excited you're joining us today, Laura. And if you got time to chat afterwards with 
me and mom and dad, whatever, if you have time or another time, that'd be awesome to hear some more, some stories about what you got going on with this good gospel. <clears throat> Today, we're going to work on uh, signs of the end was the request uh, from some of you to work on today. Reading assignments were Matthew 24, uh, Great Controversy Chapter 1, uh, Desire of Ages. Um, uh, what was the name of that chapter? It was, um, uh, it's the one that Matthew 24 is discussing. And for some reason, I can't remember the title at the moment. And then, of course, um, <clears throat> the Go Teach All Nations chapter we've been looking at for a couple of weeks. Um, and so we'll dive into that. But I wanted to say before we dive into our study, uh, and this this 2.30 is always fun for me because it's kind of more our core study group, <clears throat> those that have time. And we don't always have everybody here, but I wanted to tell you guys, uh, thank you very much for the interaction and participation this morning. Uh, that was helpful to me. I've told some of you, I, I kind of struggle with how to talk into a computer instead of a live group where I can interact and hear everybody and see what you're thinking on your face and so on so that it's it's a little more difficult but i thought this morning was especially uh went smooth and went helpful uh, for you guys to have stuff ready to pitch in even if you're talking about what we what you used to think versus what you think now that's kind of beneficial and <clears throat> i haven't heard the number not that we're counting i don't care what the number is but uh, sometimes I'm surprised Sabbath morning when I hear later how many people were actually out there listening that were not part of the conversation, but they're listening. So it's great to have you guys pitch in and add verses or add thoughts or ideas, even helping us to build, like I, like I say, the, the old idea or the wrong idea. That's real helpful because people are thinking it, but they're not able to say because they're not on the discussion group, or even if they are, Maybe they're not comfortable saying. So <clears throat> anyway, our Sabbath afternoon core group study is more for us to have a bit more open mic and just talk about things you guys are working on, uh, maybe struggling to help others understand how to explain stuff, um, how to help your neighbor is always good for us to talk about and work on. But also, I know that there's been interest on revelation and prophecy and, and that kind of stuff. So we're going to dive in a little bit to that, but I wanted to tell you all thank you for this morning. That went went well. Any anybody have any thoughts about? <clears throat> I know I asked last week about you know thoughts about how the the open group study uh, is going or should go or or something you think we should do different. Um, <clears throat> I think it's fine. Uh, some of you that you know just put your name up there and don't have video playing. Um, that actually, unless you're uh, kind of real active in the discussion, that's plenty fine. Um, and some I know, like Kalal, when he comes on, his video doesn't work real well, so it's better for him to not try to transmit video. And then those of us that are transmitting video, um, I'm not sure what it means to everybody who's watching that, that isn't part of the discussion, if you just kind of get up and leave and leave your picture on a blank wall or not, if it matters or not. But uh, maybe when you do that, you could turn it to just the name and no video. That's one thought I had from, from today. But otherwise, I really appreciate everybody jumping in. Anybody got some thoughts before we dive into our study? Uh, wasn't uh, one of the assignments was uh, the chapter of the impending conflict also yes. in the conference? Yeah. Yeah, and some of these I've been given a long list because we've kind of been working on it for three or four weeks now. And so some were reading impending conflict, you know, three weeks ago, but I keep giving the same ones because they're all kind of inter interlocked and interrelated. So yeah, that would be another one. And so anybody who didn't get to any of those chapters, um, you can dive into them this next week. <clears throat> Was there anything else that we had said for reading assignments uh, that anyone else can remember? I think we, we did time of trouble chapter. That would have been three or four weeks ago. Um, oh, I know one was about Jacob, Jacob's time of trouble, um, which we were going to talk a little bit about today. But that chapter was called uh, Night of Wrestling in uh, Patriots and Prophets. Did we miss anything, Barb? Barb usually keeps really good notes on what we're working on. 
uh, yeah, I think that was that there's patriarchs and prophets. There are two in great controversy and then on the Mount of Olives and Desire of Ages. Okay. All right. Uh, Lori, would you mind having an opening prayer for us? You said Laura, not Lori, right? Lor Lori. <laughs> 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 sure. If you don't mind, if not, we can get somebody else to do it. All right. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for bringing us all together today in a little bit more unusual way. And we ask you to be with us, to guide our thoughts and uh, the things that we discussed today. And please um, send your Holy Spirit here to be with us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if I might, uh, just since Laura uh, is, is joining for the first time that I know of, uh, let me just give a quick kind of background. Laura, we've been working on still teaching this character of God Bible studies uh, all this time. And um, I've been living here in Washington. So Washington, Oregon is where I've been interacting a lot the last few years. And and so we have a bunch of friends that we like to study together. I've avoided doing this internet thing as much as possible, but uh, when this COVID crisis or whatever hit, it kind of, everybody was saying, ah, we need to, to keep studying together, do it. So we said, okay, we're gonna have to do it on the internet, but I'm not super comfortable on the internet yet. But uh, anyway, so that's what we're doing. And we've been working on, you know, uh, I don't know if you recall, but years ago uh, we were working on Kind of the four part studies first we'd work on love forgiveness healing wrath and then we'd work on justice and mercy and then the two altars cain and abel and then um the sanctuary and of course my dad always worked on the same subject but with his drawing called the big picture which is probably what you remember better laura was the big picture studies anyway so we kind of uh are doing studies now every week where we go over those what we call the basic gospel um, and that would have been like 1030 this morning and we usually do it um, on Thursday as well And so this this particular meeting is not really we're not broadcasting it publicly It's just whoever you see on on the meeting here And the point is really one for us to discuss how to be more effective with um, Not just understanding the gospel, but with sharing it with others So stories of how we're sharing it who's sharing it and how you're doing it um, Is always welcome and, and fun to do on this meeting um, and then we are tackling a little bit of a subject today about the signs of the end. Uh, I think partly because of, you know, everything going on, people are wondering, you know, what are the signs? And, and uh, is it next week he's coming or in two months or what? Kind of discussions all over about that. So that's kind of what we're going to dive into today. Um, like I say, afterwards, if you've got any time to share and share stories with us, Laura, we'd love to hear it. Okay, so with that, um let's dive into matthew 24 and i want to have you guys just because everybody hopefully read it at least once um if you can kind of just give us an overview of what you saw <clears throat> first as maybe the most important point in the whole chapter so just one you get to pick one <laughs> what you saw is the most important point and then two um what you what do you think the most important question that you have out of reading it or like what should we try to solve today what do you think the most important question or the hardest part to understand or however you want to say that and i'm just gonna let you guys open your mics and and pitch in here and tell me your thoughts on it before we start diving into it Well, one of the um, things that I notice in, in verse 5, um, which says, uh, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. So, is, is he just talking about, here's the question I have, is he just talking about people who are pretending to be Jesus? Like who are actually claiming that they are, you know, the son of God or something to that effect, um, which we've had a few of those in our our time. 
Or is he talking about people who claim his name, as in calling themselves Christian, but they're deceiving many in that regard? Okay, that's a good one to put on our list. <clears throat> good, good point and good question. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. All right, who else? Somebody thought would be uh, an important point, either because you, you liked what it said or you got a question about what it said. Looks like some are, uh, some are kind of reading through it real quick to read. That's okay. We're giving them time to read yep. it. Yep. <clears throat> or at least review it. Well, I've, I've kind of discussed it with you a little bit, Bob, Bobby, with the um, verse 15 when it talks about abomination of desolation, but I know it, uh, it is something that, uh, that caused me a question for sure the first time I read it. And, and then Shady and I were just reading through Mark again, and it came up again, and uh, so... I guess if, if there's time to touch on that, I think that's a subject that others might also have a question about. Good. Do you have your notes ready, by the way, Barb, from our d discussion? That was like three weeks ago. Um, um, I could I could probably get up there. <laughs> well, if you can get them ready, because those verses that we went through would be, would be probably helpful when we get to that part of the discussion. Okay, so that's a good one on the list. Who else uh, got something? Yeah, I just wanted to bring up, because uh, some people can really question uh, verse 31, where it talks about the last trump, and then his angels will go to the farthest ends of the earth, right, and gather up, and some verses say, his chosen ones, and other ones, the elect, mm -hmm. almost like we're not making the choice. You know? <laughs> so uh, I know that doesn't go with the, the crux of the Bible, but just what it says there. Sure, it's just certainly something that a question someone would have about that. Well, what's interesting to me on that one, Frank, is that it mentions the sound of a great trumpet. And wasn't that kind of what we were discussing uh, during the Sabbath message? <laughs> Uh, Revelation 11, what was it, 11, 19? That was the seventh, was it the seventh trumpet? Yep. Yeah, that was in the seventh trumpet. Yeah, but anyway. See an immediate connection there. If nothing else, uh, an angel represents a message, so maybe there's a certain message, a trumpet that has a certain sound, that is gathering together the elect. So they're, they're attracted to a message about God. <laughs> okay, anybody else got one? Just looking to see what else points you want, you thought were exciting enough to talk about today. Well, right under uh, verse 31, I, I, I like the uh, lesson of the fig tree. Oh, and Jonathan, yeah, yeah what you mentioned, verse 30, though, is, is the son of man's arriving in the cloud. So it is definitely his coming when that last trump goes. Okay. Yeah. That is true. Okay, well, if nobody else has anything, we're, we'll definitely deal with those two, and we'll kind of do them in sequence probably here. But let's do just a quick overview of 
what typically is talked about as the last signs, and some of you heard me say these things a few times before, so it's not new, but I want you to just consider them with us, add anything that you have found since the last time we talked about this or whatever. Um, but <clears throat> starting in verse four, so Jesus is answering their question, right? Uh, so his first thing that he tells us is, is take heed that you're not deceived. Um, and then John, you, you brought up a good question about people coming in his name or saying uh, that, you know, this is the Christ, I am the Christ. Um, but it does both here in this verse, and maybe we can hear from some different versions, but it says, many will come in my name. Uh, that's kind of the one component of just claiming to be representing Christ. And then it adds, and saying <clears throat> that they are the Christ or that I am the Christ. Um, so they're trying to make a connection there about Jesus. And uh, the first warning he says is, do not be deceived. What's the most important thing for us not to be deceived about? Character of God. Yeah, and the, the intricacies of understanding the heart of God, which is also the law of God, which is the character of God. I don't mean that his heart is on tables of stone. I mean that uh, altogether, that's what that's about. It's, it's about understanding who God really is and his character. Um, so don't be deceived by that. I know when I Sounds like good, good banners of thought or good, you know, good religious ideas. And yet, when you really compare them to the truth as Jesus taught it, they don't all hold up. So, yeah, and I think it's important to, to know the true Messiah and the comforter and not have the fear because the next verse is all about fear. Wars will break out near and far, but it says, but don't panic. There you go. And that was, that was the main point I wanted to bring out in the beginning of this thing is that even like recently, what you're seeing going on around us is the effect of panic, right? It doesn't matter whether COVID is completely real or completely fake when it comes to uh, the panic uh, of, of it all, right? And why are we panicking? Why are the people panicking? It usually has to do with fear for our life, uh, fear for our safety, fear for our Right, because the next thing that Jesus is going to do is going to going to promise us that uh, we're not going to be safe. Why not? Why are our lives not safe? Verse nine: They will deliver you up to tribulations and kill you. <laughs> well, wait a minute. So they're going to deliver us up and kill us. You can't exactly be constantly fighting for your safety. Um, for a disciple, and what he, what he wanted to underscore, now I know the disciples didn't understand it that night, didn't understand it probably for a little while. By Pentecost, they're starting to really get a hold of this, and we're looking backwards, so we have the benefit of their example and their learning. But, but it really, our security and our safety have to be entirely and completely in trusting God, and you can't trust somebody you don't know. I mean, even if you've got knowledge about somebody, theories about somebody, um, they're easily shaken if you don't really know the person well. So this isn't like I used to think of when I was a teenager about read, pray, study to have lots of knowledge so we could pass the quiz or the test or make the argument. This is about really spending time to drink in and know and understand for yourself. Even hearing it from me doesn't really count. It only gets the idea started, right? Um, because really this is about knowing him. Now the disciples, when he said this, had just spent three and a half years with him. Of course, they thought they knew him pretty well. And, and in some ways they really did. They had seen him again and again and again. His behaviors, the way he treated people, uh, the way he was a constant challenge to their way of thinking. And yet, patient and loving and kind at the same time. So he was asking them, 
to remember that their security is in God and God alone. So nothing should panic you. Nothing should trouble you. Nothing should send you into a panic mode. I, I do remember, I was just thinking about this uh, a few days ago because I'm a little surprised at how long this uh, shortage of toilet paper has been going on, actually. <laughs> And I remember I was thinking about it because I was remembering walking through Walmart about three days after I had heard that there was a crisis coming and everybody's going to get locked in their houses. You know, the rumors were going around about National Guard coming any day and so on. And I remember going in Walmart and, and walking into the produce section there and looking around and going, well, I, I guess we're not panicking in Colville because look, there's shelves that are stocked. I mean, we got everything looks as normal here in the produce department. And then I kind of kept going down the aisles and everything looked good. I got way to the back of the store and all of a sudden I turned this corner and the shelves on both sides, the entire aisle was empty. And, and it sort of surprised me uh, why there would be like, what are they doing? Some remodeling or something? And I'm looking around trying to figure out what used to be here. And lo and behold, it used to be paper towels and toilet paper. And I thought, really, you gotta be kidding me. Uh, we're panicking, but we don't care about the produce. We're apparently panicking over toilet paper. I thought that was a funny thing. But I remember not feeling panicked at all. Um, but there were two uh, big, you know, bales, like 36 rolls or whatever, come 26 rolls. I don't know. Anyway, there was two, just two in the entire thing, and that's it. And I remember my first thought was, well, maybe I should buy one just because everybody else is. <laughs> but my point is, uh, when you have a view of God is in charge and God owns all the trees and God owns all the cattle and God owns and he's taking care of you, there's not really a need to panic. In fact, uh, we can go to Elisha's panic. Uh, remember, he ran for his life. Um, and then he got out there and lo and behold, uh, the birds are bringing him some food. Uh, so even if he was panicking about his food, he got it taken care of. And I think this is a one of the main elements that we should understand first about this entire thing in Matthew 24. Um, the other thing really to note is that he gives a list that we're kind of used to, wars, rumors of wars. Um, and then not, does, not only does he say, don't, let your, don't, don't be troubled about that. Um, what else does he say about those wars and rumors of wars? <coughs> What's a kind of a key element right there in those same verses? These things must come to pass. It was these things must come to pass. They're just the beginning, though. Yeah, and so what does it say in your version there after come to pass what? The end is not yet. The end is not yet. Yeah. That's a really important piece because you keep hearing people point to the disasters <coughs> as if that's proof the end is imminent. Um, for, for someone who views it from Jesus' teachings, we know the end has been imminent for how long? For a long time. A couple thousand years. been working on bringing about what needs to happen on the earth uh, before things can conclude on a consistent uh, he's working on it every day he doesn't sleep he doesn't take breaks he's always working on it but he's telling us here wars rumors of wars these other kind of disasters these are not the things that tell you that they're the end what i mean by that is you know a few generations ago um uh, i know this story from my parents uh that uh, we, uh, who are Adventists anyway, uh, our, our, our parents and grandparents would have been panicking about the new president because he was Catholic and his name was John Kennedy. And he was surely to be the one that was going to pass the Sunday law. And, and, and. So, so we keep doing that. We keep doing these things. And we want to look at, you know, the current president and is he part of the skull and bones or Illuminati or whatever label version you, you know you hear people talking about but those are not 
the signs of the end. That's not telling you uh, what really, how to really know when the end is. What, what did he put in here in Matthew 24 that really is telling us when we can know the end is imminent? It's in the next paragraph. Go ahead, read it for us. Frank. Well, I'll, I'll start with uh, verse 12. It says, sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. Then 13, but those who endure to the end will be saved. And the good news, which is funny because it says love of many will be grow cold, but then it says, and the good news of the kingdom, which is about the character of God, will be preached throughout the whole world. But that all the nations will hear, and then finally the end will come. Okay, good. So let let's put some context to that. Would you say, Frank, then that the love of many growing cold comes before or after the gospel is preached? I think you said before. I didn't hear it, but you had thumbs yes, up. Okay, before. Yes, before. I'm sorry, I didn't tap speaking. No, that's okay. Good. So, so in other words, if we look at a pattern, I like to look at patterns from. Uh, the scriptures, the old stories, uh, the pattern, if we look at Jesus's time, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the, it's called the fullness of time. In the chapter, Desire of Ages, the fullness of time, it'll describe the condition of the people just before Messiah's coming, meaning the first coming. <laughs> and, and that description fits this. In fact, temple in the sanctuary uh, in the outer court uh, which is why jesus flipped over the tables so the fact that he flipped over the tables kind of tells us that all of that was going on this lawlessness was going on right there and it had been going on for a long time prior to jesus coming it didn't just happen a few weeks before it was building and building and it had become so common that the people were no longer even thinking this was a problem of what was going on. Well, then if you go to the wider context, of course, in the Roman, let's call it the political realm, um, just the world politics, uh, yeah, that, that corruption had been there for a long time as well and wasn't changing, it wasn't getting better. Um, and so into the middle of that uh, love growing cold and, and, and the disaster of, of lawlessness everywhere abounding, that was the context in which uh, Messiah stepped into it for the purpose of delivering truth, which is the growing cold. Selfishness enough that will fight physically fight in Walmart over a bale of toilet paper or something, right? That's showing that level of hostility. That's the time uh, when it's going to be the darkest on the earth, when is the prime time for the gospel to be preached with more effect than it's ever had before, versus us looking at it as though all that fighting uh, over the toilet paper or whatever, I'm just using that as an example, uh, means that Jesus is going to show up any minute and destroy the wicked and take all his believers home. That, that's more the popular common kind of thought out there. Instead, we should see it as now is the time, if we're seeing these troubles, now is the time that God is wanting to put together uh, later, you pointed at verse 31 to talk about the elect and the work that the elect are supposed to do on the earth, the disciples, the teaching representing of the true gospel. But let me pause there and let anybody else want to pitch in on that? So key, don't be troubled. Don't panic. The world will panic. They're going to panic all around you, but you don't need to. Debbie, you got something? Jump in. I'm backing up. Um, if you don't mind, Annie, uh, verse 16, Matthew 24, verse 16. Um, Jesus said, Behold, I am the door of the sheep. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Well, I, can, I can, can't quite make out what Debbie, what you're saying. Is anybody else hearing her okay? No. I don't know if you got to get closer to your Early. 
microphone or if you got a volume control, try to talk louder. Can you hear me now? Barely. Uh, well, Tim's the technician. You heard me last week. I can shout if you want. Oh, there, now we heard that. <laughs> I, I think it's just got to get close to your laptop there. I mean, right up here. Oh, now I hear that. Turn your hearing aid up. <laughs> so, wars and rumors of wars. I used to think they were wars of overseas, but I'm thinking does COVID 19 fit in the wars and rumors of wars? There's going to be another war after, there's going to be another invisible enemy after COVID that's worse, et cetera. Okay, I got the question, I think. Um, I'll, I'll say this much that, you know, certainly anything that is humans working against humans uh, is going to be connected to this idea of war. I know there's a lot of speculation going on about who caused this and was it biological warfare. And sure, it, it pro probably all could be and could fit. Um, I think ultimately, though, what matters is that we we know that God is working at blessing, healing, helping, and saving. Um, th then there's Satan and his program and all the minions that work for him. Uh, and, and all of that is always going to be about um, self-preservation, uh, harm, disaster, hurt, and destruction. So I don't know that we need to necessarily, I guess what I'm trying to say, I don't know that we need to necessarily kind of make that fit into some package. I think Jesus was talking just simply and saying, look, uh, there's been wars, there's going to be wars, there's going to be rumors of wars that may not happen, or they may be a long ways away. You know, for the Israelites, war was kind of a real thing all the time in Jesus' day. And what I mean by that is not that they were out there lined up with soldiers but they dealt with soldiers every day. And uh, some of the Israelites thought it was you know, a good idea to throw rocks at the soldiers or give them a hard time. And then they'd get beat up or put in prison or who knows what, how all that went. And then you get stuff like, like Herod and he's, he's killing all the children in the whole town. I mean, that, you know, we don't, if you heard of that going on, say down in, in New York or Seattle or something, right? We'd be like, oh my goodness. Um, so they had some horrific things going on already when Jesus said this is my point. So I think what he's trying to say is don't be distracted by those things. Don't be distracted or worried about wars and rumors of wars. You know, n nobody believed a uh, hundred years ago that we would have a world war. Uh, and then we've had two now. And then some want to talk about how well be before Jesus can come, we have to have another world war. None of that's true. There will be wars and there will be rumors of wars. But the point is, don't be troubled by those things. We have one focus. We have one thing that is important for us to be on, and that is to know and understand Jesus and how that helps us know and understand his Father. And the second thing would be on helping anybody who's confused, deceived about that, for them to have a chance to know and understand him correctly. That, that's it. Everything else is sort of background to us, just like it was background to Jesus. Um, you had during Jesus' time, active skirmishes and fights between Israelites and soldiers, which is why when Jesus said, um, you know, uh, if, you, if the soldier asks you to carry your pack one mile, uh, carry it two. Uh, they didn't like that idea. They, were, they thought their job was to throw rocks at the soldiers and really give them what for, because they're, they're the heathen, 
you know, uh, outside of our country. They're not part of us. It'd be kind of like, you know, some other country invading us here and we'd have a big attitude about that. So, so they had that sort of warish attitude. Jesus yet and and did, did Jesus uh did you, did you see him and meet him in a way that you got healing in your life right now, I think that's why he's saying it in this context in Matthew 24 he does add to this and here's probably our next important thing we kind of jumped over it when we went down to verse 12 but in 9 then they will deliver you up to tribulations and kill you the point isn't that that's supposed to be scary the point is plan on it know it's going to happen that way it doesn't surprise you don't go looking for it don't try to make somebody you know mad at you so you can say you're persecuted or offend them with your words about jesus so that you can say that you're persecuted just know that the world and what i mean by that is the worldly thinking hates the gospel even christianity so-called that teaches a cross that a god needed some sort of blood payment so that he could become a forgiving god that that christian so-called world hates the gospel uh it's always surprising to me how angry and bitter they come against uh when we start laying out the truth about the cross and the truth about jesus according to the words of Jesus. And again, I don't mean we're going looking for persecution or or pointing fingers and saying, there, there's the persecutors. We can be silent on all of that. Just know that when the latter rain occurs, which is an important part of this whole last day thing, when the latter rain occurs and people, just just people, common, simple, whatever jobs you came from people, start really sharing the goodness of, uh, about God with, with conviction and knowledge and understanding, not in a sort of I'm going to authoritatively teach you way, but in a I care about you, love you, want to help you, lay hands on, heal the sick way, uh, then the results will be, Satan will be upset. He, and will, go, he will be angry and come against it. Go ahead, Frank. Yeah, and to go on to that, you know, with the wars, rumor wars, and it goes on about persecution and about the love growing cold because of sin and rampant. I, I can see that during this time, people will be open to this because I, I, you just look in our society today with 50% divorce rate and such, uh, families tacking each other. And so there's a lot of broken people and they're looking for something. They're looking for that love that only God can give. Which is why it makes it a perfect time for, meaning, meaning these, when, when love grows cold and all that, because then those, there are some who don't have it, but they would like it, right? We see that in Jesus' day, again, the pattern. Um, there was many who hated it, but you notice Jesus doesn't spend much time on that. He doesn't spend time worried about it, thinking about it. He knows the cross is coming, but he's busy helping uh you know the woman at the well <laughs> or he's busy uh talking to this boy about his five loaves and two fish he's busy uh, giving the goodness about god the kingdom of god he doesn't have to worry about it, which again is why i think he's saying don't be trouble Because the real question is, where are these people? Where are the ones who are filled with the Spirit, who are running to and fro with their faces lighted up? That's in great controversy, right? Faces lighted up to proclaim the, from your verse, Frank, this gospel of the kingdom, which will be preached to all the world as a witness. Uh, someone else jump in, anyone on that? Just that little bit. 
good time for Laura to tell us a story about the last sermon she did, maybe. <laughs> well, we just read today in Great Controversy, page 528. Um, we were reading about, um, here, I'll just read the sentence. Satan can present a counterfeit so closely resembling the truth that it deceives those who are willing to be deceived, who desire to shun the self-denial and sacrifice demanded by the truth. And I think talking about uh, persecution and tribulation and trial against those who are preaching the truth, the truth requires self-denial and sacrifice. And if someone is unwilling to, to be sacrificial and be self-denying, they're going to fight against that. We're not fighting against flesh and blood, and they're not really fighting against us. They're fighting against a principle that's requiring self-denial of them. Exactly. So I think, um, yeah, the truth, the truth is always going to ask us to take up our cross. What, what's, the name of the, what's the name of the chapter you're in? Is that? Snares of Satan. Snares of Satan, okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it talks uh, some about that more in detail as well in the uh, scriptures are a safeguard, right? Mm -hmm, about right. Satan's ability to deceive. But, but it's an important point you make, uh, Laura, because when, when we look at this persecution thing and the world hating, uh, it's interesting. Jesus said the world will hate you because they hated me. Now, what he meant was um, the goal isn't for us to see how many people we can get hated by. <laughs> uh, the reason the world hated Jesus is because of what you just said. Uh, Judas ultimately hated that self-denial, that self-sacrificing love concept. Um, and it, it is interesting how many people can quote scriptures and talk about religion and then in the next moment, they'll make a comment like this. Well, all you guys do is you talk about love, too much love, <laughs> as if there could be such a thing. So a counterfeit can be couched in what sounds like a lot of religious knowledge, a lot of quoting the scriptures, a lot of um, what seems to make reasonable sense. But, but this part, Satan can never reproduce this self-sacrificing love part. He, 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 he hates it. He doesn't like it. He doesn't want to have to reproduce it. And even if he wants to, to trick you, he can't. He, he doesn't have the ability to do it. <laughs> so the hating of the disciples by the world isn't because they're rude, unkind, um, you know, attacking the world, criticizing, judging, all that stuff. That's, that's not Jesus. That's, that's Pharisee stuff. Um, the hating is exactly what you're pointing at. It's, it's the ultimate hating of what love really is which is a little bit sort of seems almost crazy like how could that happen but that's what happened with jesus right so good good point i guess you know a couple weeks ago we were talking i just want to make sure we're we're willing to consider this and dive into it in our own studies is that really for a disciple to be uh, looking at what's going on around us is not looking for the news to determine how close we are to the end. Um, what do you call it? I was going to say Pharisees, but then I thought I was going to use a different word. Um, <laughs> tellers of, what do you call people who tell the future? Fortune tellers. See, they worry about that kind of stuff. They, they, their minds go on that. They're trying to figure out what next week's fortune. For a disciple, it really is, Lord, how do we more effectively this week, today, more than yesterday, uh, share you? And I don't mean just in talking. I don't mean just in quoting scriptures. I mean actually being uh, filled with. as we called it three weeks ago, the March of the 144,000, it must happen before things can wrap up. And I don't mean must as in you must make it happen. I mean, it's, it's part of God's plan. It's his goal. Um, and I'm using that phrase just to talk about the disciples doing on the earth again, what Jesus and his disciples did 2000 years ago. 
pure gospel and with all the power that attends it. That's that will occur, uh, and you're invited to you know be part of that if you let God work in you uh, to to make you like He did Peter, James, and John. So that that's the big one in the first part of of Matthew as far as tribulation. Anybody else want to comment or bring up something about? How to look at and view tribulations and signs of the times around you. Because if not, then we're going to dive into the abomination of desolation part. <laughs> okay, so I think we're good on that. A couple weeks ago, we read from um, the chapter about the to meet the bridegroom in Christ's object lessons and the last message of mercy. All of you are familiar with that one. So that's really what we're talking about that's important in, in that first part. Um, abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. This is kind of important because um, Jesus is connecting this to when it's time to flee. And I promised to talk a little bit today about country living versus uh, flee to the mountains uh, and how those all connect and relate. So we, we want to nail down this abomination of desolation, but before we do, if of spiritual, physical, and mental, uh, what should we call it, uh, effect, draw, disaster, uh, crisis on your life from city dwelling. Um, at first, you know, I kind of like cities. I like going to visit the city. I still like going to visit the city. Um, but but I, I kind of thought, well, what, what, what's the big deal? What's the problem there? Then I read in, in uh, back in Genesis, and it said that Abel, or after Abel, Seth, so the followers of God, Seth, Abel, Seth, and, and those descendants, they dwelt in tents. Uh, and it doesn't say much about it. I just thought, well, that's interesting, living in tents. When I was a kid, I thought that was fun to go camping, right, live in tents. But apparently they lived in tents all the time. Uh, and then someone will quickly say, well, yeah, but they lived, you know, in a warm climate. Uh, not in Washington, <laughs> where we get lots of snow. It's kind of hard to live in a tent year around here. But that isn't the point. The point that it's making clear back there in the Old Testament is that we tend, sinful humanity, when we tend to build and to um, kind of get everybody together, uh, it it's, tends to be the strategy that we just build evil and more evil, and we different lifestyle. It was about a lifestyle like Enoch had, where he didn't have the hustle and the bustle and the busyness. Uh, it's amazing how we can move to the country now and we still just fill our lives with hustle and bustle and busy and work. We, we accomplish city right in our own living room even. So it's not really talking about, um, you know, how many houses in your town, like compare which towns are the right size to live in or not. It's talking about a lifestyle of leaving aside the worries, cares of the world, the panicking about all the things they're panicking in, panicking about. And then, and then it kind of underscores it in this crisis when you see how much higher, not just the panic, but the actual mm, dilemma, the, the what to do about the problem, how, how much more difficult that is in the city uh, versus if you live out in the country somewhere. I think of the quote where Sister White said, uh, those that live and have a little piece of property and can grow food during, and, and, and we refer to it as the little time of trouble. Later, maybe I'll talk about that, but um, don't, there's not in the Bible a little time of trouble, but it's talking about before the great tribulation, the time leading up to the great tribulation. Sister White was just referring to how uh, life would be simpler, easier, uh, less hectic and crazy. Um, and instead of worrying about the sicknesses that might come through the normal food delivery chain, how it might be more healthy, like right now, up here, you know, when everybody's worried about 
whether we're going to be able to get food at Walmart next month or not. Uh, we're, we're, we're tending to plant more stuff in the garden. That's all. You don't have to panic. There'll still be food. So country living is not, what I'm trying to say is country living is not what is the panic and run to the hills part of, of this great tribulation thing. That is very specifically connected to these verses in Matthew. Uh, because Jesus said, when you see these two things, the abomination of desolation, uh, as spoken of by Daniel the prophet, and then elsewhere he added, and the, the army or the enemy entrenched round about. Um, when you see these things, now know it's time to flee. So we're talking about Israelites in their context living. about um, when you see those two things now know it's time to flee now this isn't just this is actually flee your home this is flee whatever you had in the cupboards for however long you had it put there for this is don't get your car don't get your cell phone don't nothing just go um and and again this is even if you're in the city this is just time to go so what what then before we get into what that might look like what is the abomination of desolation how do we put that together? This is where I'm going to take a break and let you all pitch in. Maybe start with what was the abomination of desolation? Uh, some versions say that makes desolate in Jesus' time for the disciples who were this was said to. Jesus said, um, Behold, I, I leave to you your house desolate. Okay, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Can you? Yeah. yeah. Someone so, know where that verse is? You got, you got that one up, John? I don't. I know it's in Matthew somewhere. See if you can find that one, and then, and then we're going to read that from a few different versions. So that's one of our verses we need. Jesus said, behold, your house has left you desolate. Matthew 23, 38. The temple. Okay, so first, first the temple, right? Yeah. But also, I think, of the rejection of Jesus, rejection of him. Because the temple is just a symbol of you, right? Yeah. Or in this case, them, the people he was talking to. So when he says, behold, your house has left you desolate, it was as he was leaving uh, the temple for the last time, he would not return there ever again, actually, physically, right? He was not going back there. Um, so yeah. here, the one that was to fill their temple with glory, who actually was to be their glory, who was actually the glory of God, which it was supposed to be God's house, <laughs> they were rejecting all the glory, all the truth and the goodness that God had sent. And yet they were claiming that they were still the chosen still the remnant, still the special people. And what they used to prove that they were the special people was what? A couple of things. The temple. Circumcision. Circumcision, that was one. So therefore, a connection to the blood of Abraham, right, would be a, a third one. Uh, th those are the things they used to prove and establish. It's like these little circumstantial information pieces <laughs> or furniture. Um, and yet they had rejected the God who gave them the design of the furniture. Its purpose of the furniture was to teach them about him. And here they reject him, but they cling to the furniture. That, that's a, that's a, a dilemma. That's a, that's a problem. All right. So we got the one verse. Did you find it, John? 
Yeah, yeah, it's it's that one. I mean, you almost were quoting it. It's uh, 20, 23, Matthew 23, okay. uh, 37 to 39 to read it in full context. But So, so uh, the, yeah, the reason I want the reference to everybody, look at it in your version, and let's mm -hmm. hear those verses from two or three different versions here together. So 23, what verses, John? 37 to 39. 37 to 39. Last three verses of uh, 23. Okay, John. And, and just as an example, it, it comes uh, right after the woe to the Pharisees. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So what, go ahead and read it from, what version are you reading from, John? I can read from a number of different versions, but okay, you, I'll, you, I'll go ahead and just do King James, New King James. Okay. Uh, o Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So fairly simple in that context. But he's much different. Well, I, I can read from the New Living Translation. Okay. It's very similar. It says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often I wanted to gather you, to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. And now look, your house has left you empty and desolate. For I tell you this, you will never see me again until you say, bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And I think that's, I, I love the thing about that because we're also again talking about latter times and everybody thinks, well, I need to gather enough food and such like that. When Christ <laughs> himself is saying, I will gather you under my wings. So we right. are protected. Right different form of preparation going there <laughs> so so bobby to put this into real world perspective i'm trying i'm trying to apply this to my life right now if it's saying that when you see the abomination of desolation it's time to get out <laughs> so if if I understand the abomination of desolation to mean that Jesus is no longer in his temple, could we say in his church, how do I know when that's true? Because I'm telling you, there are times when I think that's right now because I, I can think of many times where I might even use a quote from Jesus and have people in the church maybe they're not picking up stones yet <laughs> but they may as well be so you know what i mean yeah so let's let's build a little bit more on the abomination we did one verse uh who's got another one somewhere else that might give us some clues about the abomination so we can build that in detail john and then we'll get to the answer i think bobby yeah what ver what verse are we reading that was uh, Matthew 23, right at the end of the chapter there. Okay, and verse what? 37? 37, 38, and 39. Okay, I have the ESV. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. See, your house is left to you desolate, 
For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay. All right, someone take us to a verse somewhere else that helps us with what is what is abomination or what is desolation or both? With your electronic Bibles, this is where it's fun. You just put, search the word abomination or search the word desolate or both. Usually when you're trying to figure something like this out, it's good to look up every verse in the Bible that might have used that word. In this case, the list isn't real long. <laughs> da Daniel 12, 11. Okay. It says, and from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, Okay, so this is, there shall be 1,290 days. Well, and this is the one that, that is actually being referred to by Jesus, mm -hmm. in, where we started, right? Where we started was in Matthew 24, and it's talking about the spoken of by Daniel, the prophet. It's pointing to the one you just read there. So there's a mention of, of, it, of the abomination there. So, there yeah. One in Daniel 9.26. Seven is that? I thought John said twelve something. There was a one in the seventy week prophecy. Go ahead, read that one, Barb. Oh, I don't have it open right now. <laughs> or just tell us the reference again. We'll, we'll get somebody to read it. She it was nine nine twenty seven. It was talking. It was in the context of the seventy week prophecy. I have it here. Okay. It, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even unto, until the consummation which is determined, which is determined is poured out on the desolate. And the NIV says abomination that causes desolation. Causes desolation. So in the context of Jesus and the disciples and their story, what, what could we say, when, when was the abomination set up? Or when, when did that abomination take place? You're getting some specific stuff in there in Daniel. Um, what do we do with that? So to me, Daniel 9.27, the first uh, first sentence is telling us that Jesus would confirm a covenant, right, for one week. Um, but in the middle of the week, he would bring an end to sacrifice and offering. To me, that's a reference to the cross, but maybe I'm wrong. The, the one and only sacrifice needed puts yeah, an yeah. end... Yeah, you don't need to be um, um, <clears throat> unsure about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, that, that one week, the first half of the week, right, which would have been three and a half days or three and a half years, that's specifically the three and a half years that Jesus preached and taught in active ministry. And then the cross occurred, according to the 70-week prophecy, exactly right in the middle of that week. So yes, it's very much referring to that, but, but draw some connections about the abomination to that. So then it says, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate. So the wing, I'm not really sure about that, but whatever this abomination is, it makes things desolate or it makes them, in my mind, Desolation means without Jesus, without God. Right. So, in a, in a to make the symbolic connection of desolate, Daniel, how 
and the abomination would cause a desolation. And you can see that desolation in Israel. Um, the proof of the desolation is what? What was the proof of the desolation? Tracy, we haven't heard from you yet. What's the proof of the desolation? Come on. I'm all ears, but I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking it means, <laughs> I think it means without God, right? Or without God. So what was the proof that they were desolate? Uh, their actions, must have been their actions. Yes, and the actions specifically towards Jesus, right? So in other words, if they're claiming to be the special chosen, they've got the law, they've got the sanctuary doctrine, they know the truth. And yet in their actions, they put Jesus on a cross. And crazy enough, they got to put him on the cross and they got to get him off the cross before sundown because they got to hurry home and do what? Keep Sabbath. Um, th this mm -hmm. is a clear description. That, use that word. What? Oh, God, don't. Excuse. <laughs> well, Jenny just brought up Luke sixteen sixteen. Luke sixteen fifteen. Oh, fifteen. Yeah. Where are you at in Daniel? No, Luke. Luke. Okay, Luke sixteen fifteen. What you got? What you got there? Well, it's Jesus's words. It's in red. You are those who justify yourselves before men. But God knows your hearts, for what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Oh, there, that's helpful. <laughs> that's helpful. Put that one on your reference list. Now, could someone, I'm wondering, what, what uh, uh, translation was that? It's New King James. Okay, so when we read some of these other more popular so to speak ones do they do they use that same word abomination because that's really helpful there luke what say it again jenny luke what 16 15 16 verse 15. mine mine and esv says can you hear me yep and he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. So it's who, who are you serving and who are you pleasing? Right. So he uses the word abomination. Good. Uh, I, I, I found one in um, Jeremiah. It's Jeremiah 22.5, but I think I need to come running into it. So I'm going to start with one. Thus says the Lord, go down to the house of the king of Judah and speak there this word and say, hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, who sits on the throne of David, you and your servants and your people who enter these gates. Here it comes. Thus says the Lord, do justice and righteousness and deliver from the hand of the oppressor him who has been robbed and do no wrong or violence to the resident alien the fatherless and the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. For if you will indeed obey this word, then there shall enter the gates of this house kings who sit on the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, and they and their servants and their people. But, here it is, but if you will not obey these words, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that this house shall become a desolation. A desolation, there we go. <laughs> That's useful. Again, it's describing what's going to happen if we uh, throw out God's law, God's character, truth about God. We throw that out. It's going to turn into, and then it gives that description, desolation there. I, I just want—I just wanted to say on these these words. Sometimes when you look these up, you kind of got to know to look them up in the right versions of your Bibles. What I mean is, uh, if you're reading in NLT. Uh, New Living or something, it might use a totally different word. It might not use the word abomination. And then it's hard to look up in King James, the same word or New King James. So so find what word your version is using and then look that word up in that version everywhere else in the Bible and see where else that same word gets used. And they don't all do it the same, but, but we'll get to the same point. 
is not a problem with the translations. We're going to get to this. And that is when you take all these verses and put them together, when did Jesus see the abomination set up in his day? When, when was the abomination in existence? When did Jesus look and see, oh, there's the abomination right there. When he was 12? Yep. <laughs> when, he was, when he was 12 years old. Not on the donkey? No. Well, he saw it there too. But I'm going to when was the earliest that he could see evidence of the abomination. Oh. He, he saw it at 12. And the reason why I want to say that <clears throat> or bring that up is because notice what he does with that information. One, he does not throw rocks. Two, he does not accuse and condemn. He does not use that information in any way on the people. He uses it, and this I'm going to sort of just paraphrase now the rest of his life before his ministry. He uses it to go home and study and pray and learn and know and be ready to start his ministry at age 30. That's what he did with that information. Uh, it's dangerous for us to have that kind of information because we tend to throw rocks. We tend to, oh, we can, instead of pointing at that group over there, we could point at that group over there. But Jesus knew at 12 that the abomination had already been set up in the temple. Here's how he knew that. Remember, he asked questions of the Pharisees, of the teachers of the law. And in Desire of Ages, you can get a little bit of detail, not lots, but a little bit about what some of those questions were about. And if you, if you review that chapter, uh, I think it's called um, As a Child, and then there's one right after As a Child. You'll see there that the questions that he was asking them or that he was dealing with even at 12 was, what was the real meaning of the Messiah? What was the real purpose of the Messiah? He could see that they had gotten confused in thinking that God needed dead animals in order to somehow make forgiveness work uh, for his people. My paraphrase, that's my wording. Um, it says it in a little clearer specifics there in Desire of Ages. But, but this was some of the main points that they were confused about was what was the work of the Messiah, the meaning and purpose of the Messiah, and what was the real kingdom, right? So we're talking about the whole gospel. He could see they were learning teaching, advocating a false gospel. Uh, that's our, our warning words here about, be careful of those who will deceive you coming in my name saying that they are the Christ. Uh, so John, you're, you're, what you were working on there about expanding that out past just the idea of someone claiming to actually be Jesus, yes, it does cover even a claiming to teach the truth, but the truth not really matching Jesus. Uh, so it's covered up, covers all that. And this was the abomination that Jesus could see in his own house, in his own temple, in his own land, in his own church, in his own community. And so, what that, go ahead, John. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I don't want to cut you off in the middle no, of the ahead. thought. But um, so in Daniel, the um, not remembering which one we read, but it said the one who brings the abomination on so, the wing yep on the wing yeah. of abomination will be one who makes desolate right so what is is that just a single person is it a like we often say the antichrist and we think of that as a a person or whatever but um is is that what it's referring to well so what did the new let's add what did the new testament actually say about antichrist um, well, I will, uh, Google it. <laughs> Just so we can see if that fits. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of different references. Okay, I think, 
I think it's talking about a misrepresentation of God, antichrist or anti-God, misrepresentation of God. Okay. What is it? What do we get out of uh, either from Peter or or maybe First John about antichrist, John? Toss some references out and just read them real quick, real short. Okay. Um, First John four three. Okay. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already it is in the world. Okay, so uh, look up the next one while, while I say, so Frank, that says exactly what you said. Uh, the spirit of Antichrist would be that which is working against Christ, um, not just against as in a physical person, but uh, warring against the very teachings, right? The truth that, that Christ brought is what we had talked about there. Okay, got the next one, John? Uh, let's see, First John 2.18 says, Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. All right, and this was written how long ago? Yeah, a long time. Long time ago. <laughs> so it's kind of like the wording we're still, you know, uh, it's interesting to hear him talk in a, what, 1800 year ago context uh, that, hey, the, the last hour is now. You've heard that Antichrist was going to come, but then it mentions that there's lots of them already going, right? Mm-hmm. And the first verse that you read, or a couple of verses you read, said the same thing, that there was many antichrists out in the world already. So if antichrist, it's appropriate to say, though on the wing of abomination, right, is one that makes desolate, that that would be antichrist. Now, we usually want to jump into the, the what's his name? Uh, it, is, it is Satan. Uh, Satan is the one behind all of them, and then it takes all of them together, and then most importantly, it includes all the teachings, ideas, doctrines of. So the the wing of abomination would be the any false misrepresentation of God, uh, and you and then you can lock it into different eras. What I mean by that is if if you were to identify who was the biggest sort of name antichrist name in Jesus' day, who would you name? Who was it? Uh, who, was the, who was the big uh, antichrist in Jesus' day? My, my mind jumped to Caiaphas, okay. um, but only because he would have been lifting up and, and purporting or supporting the false system that Jesus recognized at the age of 12. And he, he led that, right? And he kept leading that right down to the end, even, even being part of paying the soldiers uh, to lie about Jesus' resurrection. That's all Antichrist. Was he the only Antichrist? No. No, because also Judas was. Um, also, the other Pharisees on the council were. Uh, then there comes Saul. The guy that's killing Christians. Oh, yeah, he was converted and became un-Antichrist. <laughs> he became for Christ and not Antichrist. So let me ask you this, and maybe I'm going way out, way out on a, a limb here, but when the verse says, those who confess not that Jesus is come in the flesh, the my mind that's been trained a certain way <laughs> automatically assumes that what that means is that that would be someone denying that Jesus ever even showed up on the earth. But that's too easy. Well, <laughs> it certainly would include that. Yeah. But you're right, it's too easy. Wouldn't it also include those who won't let him in to their flesh or in, you know, to, to let them in let him into their hearts? I think that certainly you could um, include that. Um, that's going to be sort of the ending of the story of that part. 
um, in the middle there is going to be anything that says that Jesus did not represent the Father fully and completely. And here's what I mean. Uh, in theology, we say, well, Jesus came and he showed us the mercy side of God. Uh, and then he went to the cross so we could watch God, the Father, do the justice side on Jesus. Oh, here's a clear verse that says exactly what you just said. Okay, go ahead. It's another one. I'm, I'm surprised that I don't think of 1 John when I think of an Antichrist <laughs> uh, chapter because he talked about it a lot, apparently. But 1 John chapter 2, verse 22. Um, and it says, let me read it in a good version here. Um, chapter 2, verse 22. Uh, now let's start at verse 21. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Son, the Father, and the Son. So there's the connection of Father and Son being kind of one. Right, and, that, and that's important because Satan, since those things were written, has accomplished um, portraying Christ who came, but then only partially represented. In other words, he wasn't the son. And they don't say that he's not the son. They say he is the son, but sonship would mean that they're the same, that if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the father. And so when any idea is taught that is making God out to be a little different than Jesus is denying the father and the son. It is, it is denying that Christ was the Messiah, even though we've learned to, to not say it in those words. So it sounds like we're not denying it, right? So that, that's the connection there in that one about Antichrist. So very good. Okay, so abomination of desolation. And I got to uh, kind of at least bring this to a little bit of a conclusion before we go too much longer. We kind of went past our time already. Um, <clears throat> Abomination of desolation, put simply, in Jesus' day, the false teachings, the misrepresentations of God happening inside the chosen remnant people was the abomination. And what was it making desolate? It was making his house and all the people desolate. So Jesus walks into the middle of that desolation and says, okay, I've brought you water. And he starts to pour it on, the goodness about God, the the miracles, the, the teachings that he did. He's giving them the opportunity, the gift uh, to, to receive uh, what would, would destroy the lie and give them the truth, right? So he didn't use this information about the desolation on them or against them or to attack them is my point. He came not to judge, but to save. Save from what? In this context, save from the abomination. All right, so Jesus knew it at 12, but when did the disciples know it? Because they didn't know it when Jesus was 12. They didn't even know it. After, after his resurrection? Good. It wasn't until, I remember Jesus said things to them early on, like, leave them. They're blind guides. Um, <clears throat> he, he commented a few times to them about the Pharisees and leaven and bread, right? Not, not going with the leaven of the Pharisees or the teachings of the Pharisees. He was... And I'm going to call it hinting at because he wasn't making direct accusations about people. But he was warning the disciples that everything that they had learned growing up had to be reevaluated and reconsidered because some of it was wrong. Um, now, he didn't push that every day on them. He didn't, you know, work hard at getting them to, oh, yes, our leaders are all wrong. That wasn't the conversation. That wasn't the point. The point was for them to start to see the difference between the truth versus what was commonly believed or thought of. Now, the disciples got it kind of slow, maybe faster than me, but they, they, they got it kind of slow. And finally, they did see that, uh-oh, when they crucified Christ, and now here they even learn about themselves. They themselves weren't any better than Antichrist because they ran and hid. 
and later they, it says they uh, reviled themselves for that. They, they were greatly ashamed that they couldn't keep their promise and not leave Christ, right? So, so they didn't separate themselves and go, we good, they bad. What they did was is they saw the whole house of Israel was under the abomination, had been made desolate. Um, and so then they too did not go running around throwing rocks at people about that. But they did say some pretty straight things. On the day of Pentecost, Peter said, right, Christ whom you crucified uh, in the flesh, uh, and then he offered the redemption to them. Uh, that was the message. The message was the, the gospel and salvation and redemption. Then I like Stephen. Stephen takes them step by step through their history all the way back with Abraham and how generation after generation after generation had rejected God. And he says, you, you stiff-necked people, right? He was referring, again, to his house. It was, Stephen was part of that. It was his home. It was his church. Uh, when he saw that, he, he included himself in that in so much as he had been part of that history. But now he was appealing to them to see what he could see. Now, remember, he got to see into heaven and to see God. And he wanted them to see that instead of rejecting it. But nonetheless, he says to them, you stiff-necked people, you always turn away. But he didn't say that. Jesus didn't ask Stephen to say that before the gospel had been preached and before it had been rejected and before the cross had been accomplished. So here's my point, John. No matter where you see uh, the abomination, whether it be in that denomination over there or the other one over there, or even the one we're part of. The point is not to throw rocks. And the point isn't to decide, is today the day that the abomination is set up? Jesus did the fig tree, and this is the one you can study this next week, and maybe we'll finish this conversation next week. But Jesus gave the fig tree to make the point that there was no fruit. The house was desolate. The tree was empty. Had a lot of good looking leaves. It knew how to dress right and all that and look good, but it was empty. And the people going there were not finding healing. They were not finding change in their life. They were not finding a joy in the Lord. They were finding uh, nothing but a dead tree. So Jesus used that parable to again declare the condition of the house that just a couple days later, at the end of the woes of the Pharisees, he would say, behold, your house is left to you desolate. Don't call a house desolate until first you've laid down your life Little baby. to preach the gospel, and I don't mean sermons, to live the gospel, to present the gospel, and, and, it is, and it becomes very clear that they hate it, and they hate you, and they hate God. Until yeah. then, hey, don't Bob. be worried. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Frank. I just saw it very interesting because it just connected in my head when you brought up the, the tree without fruit but had the foliage. It reminded me also another of his parables of the wedding feast and the man coming in and not wearing the garment. <laughs> exactly. It was the same thing. Same thing. And, and again with the vineyard where he dug about it and planted it right and then he gave it out to the, the husbandmen who were going to take care of it but they wouldn't give their his portion of the crops, again, parable after parable actually is going to say that same thing. But it's, it's helpful for us to see that this seemingly veiled, symbolic, maybe complicated language is really putting in front of us a reality that you can watch play out in Jesus's life. And you can know that when the gospel is taught again, when it is preached again correctly, and if you're going to be part of doing it, <clears throat> it's going to be about laying your life down and sacrificing everything to help them, whoever them are, to understand. And only if they have rejected it and rejected you, and I don't mean just rejected you, because what if you, if they reject you, but then the next disciple comes in and they'll listen to them. Okay, good. We'll applaud to that too. It doesn't matter which disciple they hear it from, Paul or Apollos, but when you see them rejecting it in a large, public, loud way, now, now we can start saying, behold, your house is left you desolate. So, so uh, but, but to just, but now that's still us telling them we've come to the point where we're speaking woe to the Pharisees. But I, I'm wondering about this point where we're, we're actually instructed, okay, now it's time to go. 
<laughs> so, so what I was going to say real quick is let me leave the enemy and trench roundabout for next week because I already okay. burned you guys up here for two hours. Um, and, and, and we'll continue on. I think that if you read the fig tree chapter, uh, which is called a doomed people, I believe, in Desire of Ages, a very, very important, valuable chapter in Desire of Ages, read that one this week. And um, the next week we'll make the connection about the enemy and trench roundabout and maybe a little more about the difference between country living versus, yeah, getting out, even if you're in the country, get out. And where to and, and some of that. Anything else uh, other than just those prophecy things that somebody wanted to share tonight before we quit or, or put out there something you're learning, something was exciting, you read, studied, shared? I want to give a little bit of time to that. Did we ask? Did we ask Shady John if it was okay to uh, put that recording from last? I think it was last week uh, on about the Sabbath discussion. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Barb oh. asked me. Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay. Cool. Uh, yeah. So there's now I just need to do the video editing and editing and break out the the Sabbath part of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can cut that off as a separate. We went for what, about 40 minutes or so, Shady? I don't remember. Yeah, it was a little while. I don't, I don't remember how long, but it was um, more than just, you know, like a five-minute discussion. Yeah. Yeah, for those of you that might want to listen to it, uh, it I'll just say this. It, it was a good discussion about, and you, what you could glean out of it is how – to approach the discussion with somebody that didn't grow up with it, right? Because uh, Shady was asking me a good question. She didn't grow up uh, with, with that concept or that idea. So we had a good good chat about that and you might uh, benefit from um, listening to that. And how we, we even talked about how it sort of related to the end and why, why is there potentially a, a Sunday law problem versus a Sabbath law problem and, mm -hmm. and all that. So it was, I heard it was interesting anyway. A couple of people were listening in. <laughs> yeah, hey, Bobby, I, I just have a, a technical bit of housekeeping. Sure, go ahead. Um, so I've been experiencing, I have a very high-speed internet here. Um, I'm pulling, you know, real, really good speeds, but I still have my audio cutting in and out every once in a while. It just goes blank. I see lips moving, I see video, but no sound. And then it comes back on, you know, seconds later. Anyway, so I've been doing a little research. One of the potential issues is that it suggested to make sure that your Zoom app is, is uh, updated and the latest version. And I know that they just recently released a new updated version. So. Uh, just as a housekeeping thing, if when you get a chance, check your uh, Zoom app and make sure you're updated to the latest version. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, John. How's things going uh, on the north end of town there, Frank, up there in Kettle Falls? All is good. Thank you very much. All is good. Yeah, have, just have, up, plenty of toilet, have plenty up, of toilet paper. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I was just up near your house the other day, uh, a couple blocks up from you there, doing some construction. They dug a, Chris was doing that. Yeah, dug a foundation. working on that uh, blue house, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was, I was just up there to drop off and then pick up the excavator. Okay, you doing all right, Tracy? Yep, a okay. Running around like a chicken with my head cut off, but other than that, good. <laughs> I'm staying up till the wee hours reading this stuff. I read the um, destruction of Jerusalem this week a couple times, and I was just, I was so amazed by it. I, I, I don't know. I was just, it just wasn't scary to me. It just, it gave me a lot of peace, and I always thought that was gonna be a. I always avoided that chapter, and it. <laughs> It was just really cool and 
some of the details, I, I felt so sorry for Titus, you know, because it, it kind of gives some details about their, of him and how he did not want to destroy that. He did not, he really wanted to reason with the Jews, but they're having none of it, you know? Yep. And that was just so sad, you know? And so now, after what you've talked about today, I'm getting a better idea of what the desolation is. And that I chapter, actually that chapter have seen it definitely, grow. Yeah, that chapter definitely spells out how desolate it was in there in that city. Yeah, but I'm like seeing it in my own life in real times. And actually, I've been seeing it for a long time. So that's kind of, um, I'm not, and I'm not afraid, you know, I'm not afraid. So I'm curious, let me Which ask you. Which is big for me. Let me ask you, Tracy, since that's a fairly new chapter for you. When you read through that chapter, either once or twice, or how many did, did it seem clear in, in explaining how God's wrath really works? Yeah. Did you get, did you get that Very out? Very clear. Oh, yeah. Yeah, really clear. So it's beautiful. Yeah, I always like to ask that when someone's first working on that chapter because it's a little surprising how <clears throat> confusing that topic is for us when it's just written out real simple and plain right in there. <laughs> what chapter is that? Chapter one of Great Controversy. Oh, okay. Yeah, that chapter, it's, 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 it starts with um, Jesus you know, right where he was doing the woes of Pharisees, then kind of skips through to lay out the history of what took place from the rejection of Christ until um, AD 70, when, so 40 years after Christ ascended to heaven, when the whole city was totally destroyed by the Roman army. And it's explaining why and what happened and why that was. And, um, and it's a pretty good connection there to understand how God's wrath is not really him, you know, beating the people up. It's him uh, withdrawing and giving them over uh, to their choice, which in this case was to reject Christ and therefore have no protection from uh, Rome. Uh, and it even spells out that that lack of protection wasn't just that God moved his hand. Um, right, Tracy? Because in that chapter, you kind of start getting the view that the, the Roman soldiers were so angry at the Jews because of the way they acted, because of their stubbornness, because yeah. of their, right? And, and here Titus is even telling them, look, if you just lay down your arms and, and submit, right? Because it had to do with political warfare. It was the Jews trying to throw off the Roman yoke all the time. And so the Romans said, no, look, you, you, we conquered you. Now you need to behave. Uh, and they said no. And so in their sort of, um, and this, well, this is part of next week's, <laughs> about thumbing their nose at the government is what brought about this uh, destruction. So it's not just that, that God took away an invisible hand that would have otherwise made it so they would be immediately killed by the Romans. It was really about how their sinful, st stubborn, um, <clears throat> you know, prejudice, uh, angry at other people, how that all brought as like a, a reaction back on them, uh, which is what we're going to talk about some next week with the whole approach to the Sabbath and the Sunday and the rebellion and rejection and the not being protected kind of time of trouble. <laughs> so yeah, that chapter. You know, Bobby, I was, um, I was really touched by the way Titus, Titus was towards them. That that really touched my heart. It really did, and and that he had never actually been in the temple until it was burning. Yep. And that and and how how he was just he was so in awe of it, and he tried to prevent it from being burned, but his soldiers were so angry. They were so angry at the Jews because they'd been kind of poking at him for a while that it got burned down. But when he entered it, as it was burning, he was in awe. It was the first time he ever went in there. And I was just amazed at that reaction. Yeah. So, so it was that Shady, were you the one asking what chapter that was? Yeah, that's a great controversy chapter. Yeah. Um, 
I think Barb and I have looked at like a few things in great controversy, just through discussion, but I'm the only ones that I've been reading are patriarchs and prophets and desire of ages. Right. Which is good. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else anybody wanted to bring up? Things going okay over there, Amber? I don't know if she's still actively listening or not. I am. I just had to get to the screen where I could unmute it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It takes a minute. It's all right. It does. <laughs> yeah, everything's good over here. The sun just came out, so excited. Better, better go get some. I know. I was thinking that. <laughs> no, okay. this is good. I, I do have a, a question, actually, since go I'm ahead, bring it up. Um, I have in my notes, um, and this might be completely unrelated because I do have a line underneath it, but is there a chapter, it, it, I have a note, it's from you about Desire of Ages, mm -hmm. So Surrendered, and page 208, but I don't, does it go with this abomination? Well, yeah, it'd be, it'd be given a contrast to what Jesus was like, who was not part of the abomination, versus what the core of the abomination is. So we probably were, I was referring to it as, you know, where the Jews in the time of Christ were so rejecting of God and his truth versus Jesus, who was so surrendered, right? Uh, the quote there, Amber, is so surrendered to God was Christ that he made no plans for himself. Oh, uh, okay. okay. Daily he received the plans from the Father. And, and I often, even in my own life, just see that as a bit of a challenge of, oh, yeah, so if Jesus could live his life on this earth making no plans, who taught us to make all these plans, and how come I have so much trouble stopping? Because we're busy making out our plans for our castle building, for our whatever hopes, dreams, and it could be anything on this earth, when Jesus had just one focus. And that was his dream was to deliver the gospel to everybody and set them free from sin. And so focused was he on that, that he made no other plans for his life, but daily his father unfolded. And in that paragraph, it says, uh, just after that, it says, so should we live our lives that they might be the simple outworking of the father's plans or will. And that, but that's a challenge to us because we, we, uh, we're so in love with, what's here and what we have here and what we want to get here and what we need to have here that we get way off track and off distracted off of the main point. So that's probably the context you and I were talking about it in. That would kind of go with the country living idea. It could, I mean, we can do it even with country living. I see people do it. It's all about my property, my space, my garden, get off my property, put up the don't trespass sign to get the dogs, get the guns, and that ain't, that's not the country living Ellen White was talking about. No, um, I meant the real one. <laughs> yeah, the real, the real one, again, uh, it, it's easier to let life be a little more simple outworking of the Father's will from day to day. And, and we can learn in any context. I mean, Jesus, he, he was the same, whether he was in Jerusalem or whether he was in Bethlehem. Bethlehem was a, like a, a wicked little town, actually. Um, and then Nazareth was much more quiet and calm, which is where he did most of his growing up. But um, anyway, uh, it, it's, it's really all pointing to us learning to be living the way Jesus lived, having the thought process and focus, knowledge and faith in, in the Father as he had it. And, and no matter which part of that subject we're working on. Abomination would be the opposite of that. It would be the rejection of all of that because we know better we know the scriptures we know the prophecies we know whatever we think we know and we're going to do it this way because apparently god's way wasn't quite the right way that's that's satan's thinking it's the way satan can I, can I speak to that just a little bit sure go ahead john my personal experience so most of the people here know that i uh spent two years up in colville um spending a lot of time with Bobby, going and do minis doing ministry with them, and just being around, actually, many of you people, um, 
uh, on weekends and, and different days. Um, and then we had to move back down here. And to me, the difference has been like night and day, but it isn't just because I live in the city, like I think Bobby used the term, because uh, there's lots of houses around me. Um, it has, in just in my own experience, it has more to do with the fact that I'm surrounded by people who don't know the gospel. And they're, you know, at work, for instance. It's amazing how the, the, the attitude of people at my job is one that's just full of gossip, backbiting, fighting to, to gain position, uh, to be number one in the eyes of the boss, or to, you know, to try and uh, gain that next level in, in their uh, workplace. And just being around people who don't know the gospel, it, wear, it wearies me, it wears down your, your heart and your soul. And you just start to hunger and thirst to be with people who know God. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. Good, John. Hey, Bob, did we get any report back on uh, Wendell's uh, trying to help his uh, uncle? No, he's good you brought that up. John, did, did Wendell send you a video to send to all of us about the, the he, law or something? He did. He did. And I, I think my response to him was that we would try and set up a time where we could work on that with him. Well, if you could, if you could forward that video link to um, anybody who from last week or this week was interested, I think part of the point was for us to watch it sort of separately individually and then uh, maybe have a just a small group discussion about it. Um, so if you didn't forward that to us, if you could forward it, some of us wanted to watch it. Yeah, because, absolutely. Because John might be interested in knowing that Laura is working with someone, uh, a wife that's in that same situation. Okay. And her her working with, uh, with the wife and responses that his or her husband is giving might be helpful to to that situation, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. What I'll do is I'll get that email and I'll just forward it to everyone in the core group. Yeah, do that and don't feel anybody like you are supposed to watch it or have to watch it. Just if you're curious and want to join a conversation that I was planning to have with Wendell about how to talk to people who are starting from a very, uh, I guess you'd say, uh, um, Oh, I lost the word. Um, atheistic, maybe is the word, or agnostic uh, view of things. Um, so I guess this video, I don't even know what, I haven't watched it, so I'm not recommending it. I'm not telling you you have to watch it. Just if you're curious and want to watch it and then join a, a discussion, we'll uh, let you know when we're going to have the discussion about that topic with, with Wendell. But yeah, okay. if we could we could get that, then we could schedule a talk with him separately sooner than later. All right, I'm sending okay. it right now. Thank you, John. Thanks for setting all this up for us. Thanks everybody for joining. And uh, unless you tell me we've got something else to work on, I'm gonna let y'all go. <laughs> Shady and Barb, anything on the list we need to work on? Either, either now or <laughs> tonight, this week, sometime? We always have stuff. I thought we had some questions gathered, but I can't. Do you remember. have some? Well, I have one kind of related to today's talk. Um, it's it's not one I expect us to um, completely resolve right now or anything, but I just found it interesting that um, Daniel 927 um, from the King James, New King James Version, it, you know, because you were talking, when John was reading it, you mentioned, you know, he doesn't need to doubt about that being Christ. And the New King James capitalizes he there, and that's cool. I mean, that 
helped me to interpret it. What, but I have a parallel Bible and it, I flipped my eyes over to the New Living Translation and it seems confused on that because in that same verse, uh, it says, and as a climax to all his terrible deeds, right on the tail of, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings and as a climax to all his terrible deeds. So this, uh, you know, I was, I was comforted to hear you say to John, he doesn't need to be confused about that or doubt that what he was saying, because it, it sounded very confident, but then also it helped clarify for me, um, that I, I think this other version may have some confusion. <laughs> well, okay. And let me, let me, let me clarify then since you're working on that, that what I was saying to John about um, being confident in is that the 70 week prophecy and the, the dates and whatever timings that are in that verse in Daniel have to do with the time when Christ would come and be put on the cross. That's, that's very easy to establish. Very, uh, it's not like some, we got to bend and twist a lot of verses to try to convince even, even people who haven't heard that before or are from denominations that don't work on that prophecy. It's not complicated. It's very, very simple and easy is my point. And so we can have confidence that the context there is talking about um, he, Christ, making a covenant in the middle of the week. Now, the rest of what you're reading there, there's, it kind of bounces back and forth between he who makes desolate and he who will um, end, put an end to sacrifices and he, and so that, that would take a little more work to carefully watch the he, which he we're talking about as it goes back and forth, because um, it's quick and easy for us to throw antichrist on because of the bad sounding stuff. And then there's the, well, what's this thing with ending sacrifices and why is it capital and and, and so I would say, don't, don't um, at least hear me say in a quick, shallow version that all of that's talking about the Antichrist. Because uh, in, in a way, um, Satan was working to put an end to the sacrifice, but Christ put an end to the sacrificial system. And so you kind of got really working through there there's two things there's christ and antichrist and and what and when i the way i see it in a simple version is again to look at jesus he's in action he knew that there was uh, an abomination he goes to work to try to bring the truth satan tries to maintain the abomination the abomination was right in the temple um what needed to end was the furniture sacrificial system that had become so twisted and, and that no longer could it represent truth. That all needed to end and we needed the real one. But you have both Christ and the Antichrist at work through that entire process. It's a war. That's why it's really a war about both of them. So anyway, don't, don't uh, uh, at least I just wanted to clarify, I wasn't suggesting that I was answering that all the he's in there were antichrist. Right? No, I, I guess the, the very part was he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And I have heard previously, and I've understood that to be Christ in, you know, that the system, the old system of sacrifice ended at, the, at his, You know how we could say that Christ came and made des things desolate. Christ brought desolation. And that would be a correct statement. Yep. But only, only in the context like it's God true. hardened Pharaoh's heart, that what Jesus did was showed up and taught the truth and brought light and brought love and kindness, and it caused the desolation. While only because you got the Antichrist in there, which is Satan, and he's getting the people to reject it, right? So you could also say Lord. Pharaoh hardened his own heart, or Antichrist brought desolation, That's and both true. statements would be true. That's another thing that biblical language kind of does, is it 
you know, and then, then the translators try to translate for you by, is it a capital he or not a capital he or whatever. And, and I, I prefer to go, well, let's see, maybe they didn't know what they're talking about. So let's just <laughs> read from multiple versions, ignore the capitals and the lower cases, and just try to understand how would this all be true if it were describing Jesus's time, because it would be. And then that helps us project how it will look like to be true in the future, because it'll repeat. Well, that was a good one, though. What did you guys have other stuff? Do you remember? Shady's got, Shady's yeah, got two or three. I remember it was from Luke four. We were reading Luke four this week, and she said we should ask him. Shady, I can well, kind of remember, but I'll let you do it, Shady. Shady. There was two. There was the one where he said, um, "I don't know if I'm as interested in this one as the other one." But <laughs> the first question was, it was Luke four twenty three. Um, then he said, "You will undoubtedly quote me this proverb." Physician, heal yourself, meaning do miracles here in your hometown like those you did in Capernaum. But I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. And I was wondering if that was him hinting at his crucifixion again. Like when they told him to, if you're the Messiah, why don't you get off the cross and save yourself? Good connection. <clears throat> exactly right. Um, the other one was we were noticing a pattern that when they have demon possessed people <clears throat> that it seems like the devil almost honors him by saying you're, you're the son of God, you're the Messiah. And Jesus always tells them to be quiet. And he also, he doesn't allow he doesn't allow Satan to call him, and it is. How did you make the picture big? It's odd that Satan would honor him that way. It's like, it's like it's meant to be an insult, but it's not. I don't. Is it because? Because there's other times where Jesus doesn't want anybody to know that he's doing the healing. Like he, he allowed that leper, and then he told the leper to not go spread it around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's why, here's why Satan saying what he's saying is actually a dishonor. You're right. He's saying correct info. So it seems like, wait a minute, how would that be helping Satan? It's actually helping God or it's honoring God. <clears throat> but Jesus, the reason that he didn't go around with a, you know, a cardboard sign on him that said, I'm the Messiah was because he wanted the people to come to the conclusion that they could trust him because they loved him. They would follow him because they trusted him. They would believe him because they found him to speak truth and to do truth. Anything else is uh, coercion. Like, it's hard for us to see that because we use coercion all the time in what we do. We We sort of just use a little pry bar on somebody to just try to talk them into it. <laughs> you know, like, you know, if you said, said to your uh, child or your parent or your spouse, you know, I'd really like it if you, and then you say something. Um, if you add anything to it, like a bribe or uh, a withholding of some affection or time or, or whatever, all those things are coercion. own free will and any violation to that own his own to their free will was not something that would be honoring to god so here's satan first of all he's on this corner getting the people to argue about you know who is the christ and is there going to be a messiah and then he's got this other group over here arguing about is there really going to be a resurrection or not and then he's got another group over there arguing who's the greatest in the kingdom and he, he's got all these things going and in the middle of all of this chaos that he's creating 
then he says, Jesus, son of God, or however he says it, you know, uh, he states the facts, but for one purpose. And that was to cause all the people either to be guilt pressured into to believing him or to follow him, or more likely to cause the argument to increase, right? So it's really the result of it's going to be that they're going to argue more about is he the Messiah or not, because that was already going. So Satan saw in it a strategy to actually bring mockery towards Christ. Now, you and I looking back on the story <clears throat> and see what you said, which is, yeah, but he, he was still telling the truth. He was saying what was true. We know that to be true. <laughs> but in the time and the context of those people then, they didn't know it to be true. They hadn't gotten to the cross yet. They hadn't gotten to the resurrection yet. They hadn't gotten to the rest of it. So all it would do, and that's why Jesus didn't tell anybody that he was the Messiah. Um, he told his disciples, hinting at it. And then finally he asked that one day, remember, he asked his disciples, well, who do you say I am? And Peter, oh, you're the son of God, you know. Well, how did he come to that conclusion? And, and was that a convicted truth enough that he wouldn't deny Christ? No, not yet. But it came out of his mouth. <laughs> and so Jesus was working towards the end goal of everybody having a chance to know him and not just be pushed and pressured and, and coerced or uh, gimmicked into becoming a believer. Later in the book of Acts, we see the danger of the gimmicking into being a believer in the story of Ananias and Sapphira. They were the two that, uh, you read that I think already, where they were struck down or they just dropped dead because they promised to give everything and then they didn't and it was about lying to the Holy Spirit. Well, the whole thing there was, when I say gimmicked, they didn't really fully surrender their hearts into Christ and being one of his followers and disciples. They were more interested in the attention that they would get for being a uh, popular disciple. Right? And so that's, that's another sort of a verse. So Satan's really working on that strategy all the time. If he can't, you know, uh, get the people to reject Christ, then he'll swing the other way and sort of, uh, you know, bring it up that he is the Christ, but turn it into a mockery of some sort. But it didn't, it didn't fluster Jesus at all, but he did tell the demons to be quiet because uh, they weren't really praising him. They were going to bring more mockery on him. So it wasn't helpful to people. There's another story in the New Testament where the disciples were preaching and, and uh, someone was going around shouting, you know, that they were servants of the Most High God and all that. And, and then the disciple just turned and cast the demon out of them. Um, because, again, the demon was creating distraction and doubt. wasn't really creating a good foundation for belief and understanding. So what was the other one you were more interested in? Uh, it was that one. The, oh, that the was, one it was that one. Yeah, the one where he was uh, kind of hinting at his uh, sacrifice. It it seemed obvious, but then I I kind of felt like it was too obvious. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jesus, all the way through his ministry, you know, it was very important at the beginning that it wasn't with bells and whistles and bulletin boards and signs and posters. He did one loud poster. He turned water to wine and then he left. <laughs> and, and that, you know, caused a stir and everybody talking. And then, then came miracles and whatnot. But, but you see at the beginning, he told people, don't tell them, don't tell people that I did this. And then later he heals, um, for instance, a leper. He tells them, go show yourself to the priest. But he didn't tell them what to say to the priest. And likely they would have said Jesus did this, but that would be good advertising. But more importantly, why even send them to the priest? You know, why not just, they're clean, now go home. And it really had to do with he was sending a non-threatening, non-attacking message to the Pharisees because they could see with their own eyes somebody who had leprosy now no longer has leprosy 
How is that possible? And has that ever been done before? And they would have had to conclude, yeah, actually it was done before, but not to an Israelite. It had happened to a Syrian captain outside of Israel. Captain Naaman was his name. And uh, because of a little Israelite girl who had been taken as a slave, talking about sacrificial surrender, <laughs> taken as a slave, and she told Naaman to go see the prophet in Israel, which at the time was was Elisha. And uh, then Naaman was told to dip in the water seven times, if you've not heard that story. Uh, the water in Jor the Jordan River, very dirty, muddy river, but uh, that's where he had to go. And he did it. And sure enough, he came whole. Now, nobody in Israel who had leprosy got cured because nobody in Israel came to the prophet to ask. But an outsider came and asked the prophet. So all this would have all been brought up in the minds of the priests who had to look at these two lepers who they knew had been lepers and now they're not lepers anymore. <laughs> and that should have evoked in them maybe maybe we should reconsider our what we're thinking about this guy, right? It's a very gentle, kind sort of approach. And that, those that's always been... It said, like, go to the high priest according to Moses' law for... Because for healed lepers. Well, because in Moses's law, it defined what to do when someone had leprosy. And the priest, they didn't want it to just be everybody accusing others of having leprosy and then getting them thrown out of town, like, you know, calling them a, like right now, calling someone a China person or whatever. We got to get them out of our country, that kind of attitude. So God didn't want it to turn into just people accusing people and then people are run out of town because they have leprosy. So he said, no, you'll first have a priest, a Levite, investigate. The, the point isn't that they're doctors. The point is that they're supposed to be the ones in the, in the nation that are fair, that are seeking uh, restoration of God's people, not destruction. So first go, you show yourself to the leaders. And if they determine that you have leprosy, then they're supposed to be separated from the camp, put outside. Otherwise, it would just spread, kind of like what we're having right now with this COVID, right? Everybody stay in your own tent. <laughs> so God, uh, Jesus then knew that <clears throat> even though that was years and years ago, that still, still it was the process that a priest would declare someone unclean. And if they were unclean, the rules that they had made up about it, not that God gave in the Old Testament, but they made up about it, it was if they went around where there was people, they had to shout, unclean, unclean, to announce themselves as unclean. So very embarrassing, very, you know, degrading, very, that's not what God's plan was, but that's what the Jews did. So because of that, <clears throat> Jesus also knew that if they had been declared unclean and lepers and then just went home, then the community is going to have a panic. It'd be like letting the guy out of jail, but but the 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 government doesn't announce why it's okay to do that, right? Then everybody's putting up signs and posters about what's wrong with your neighbor. So to prevent that, the best thing would be go show yourself to the priest. And if the priest figure out, you got no leprosy anywhere, then the priest can advocate into the community that, hey, they're no longer unclean. The announcement could be made. It would be a public thing. Um, and so Jesus knew that that's, you know, would be more beneficial for those lepers to, to do that. Plus what I already said about the, the, the secret message to the priest <laughs> to <clears throat> say, yeah, and you know who did this? Jesus did this. <clears throat> so it wasn't that God had made a, a law that only the priest could detect uh, leprosy. It was more to do with the, in Israel, the Levites were considered the, the source of, you know, wisdom and leadership, and uh, they're the ones that will help us do what is right and what is just and what is true. Thank you. Yeah, good history stuff. You, that you can actually read about. <clears throat> Most of what I just said about that is in uh, uh, 
I can't think of the name of the chapter, but it's in Desire of Ages, and it's the one about that story with the ten lepers, <clears throat> where they get healed. Anything else, Barb? Um, I have a couple other things, but I'm not sure how you're. Did you Toss them out there. <laughs> well, I'll tell you if I'm. Well, I'll save that for later if I come <laughs> Um, I, there are actually two things I've texted you about. Um, okay, remind me. Okay, I'll, um, so this one, it says, I have a question we can talk about another time or whatever. Um, it says, um, related to forcing or mark of the beast and how some of the ceremonial laws, the laws of Israel seem so harsh with stoning people to death for collecting wood on the Sabbath and things like that. Um, they just seem beast-like almost. Uh, I know God was dealing with a harsh people in a harsh culture. I also know in those days it was a true theocracy, so God was directing them step by step. But it seems like force. Um, and then I know Graham Maxwell describes them as, describes some of that as emergency measures. And I guess just curious your take on some of that. Yeah, I, I agree with and like, um, you know, most of what, all of actually what I heard Graham say about this question, emergency measures, um, speaking uh, sort of in more of a language that was a good, good and useful for the setting of their culture. However, <clears throat> it's not that their culture was terribly different than ours. Um, sure, we might make different clothing, we might use different tools, we might have computers or whatever, but basic humanity has been the same always. So I think part of, and I don't remember how Graham described this part, but I think part of it is that God also wanted it seen that love could not be accomplished through command. Um, and I don't mean that he then intended to come to Mount Sinai and command it, um, but he knew that's how they'd take it. And so he, he once they said, okay, all these things we'll do, most of what you're referring to in the law was not part of the Ten Commandments. It was part of what they referred to as Moses' law, right? It was written after they said, okay, all these things we'll do. So it's almost like, God looking on them and saying, well, okay, so they they think that they have a way to accomplish this righteousness that I just described to them in the Ten Commandments. So let me give them then a civil setup on what to do if they don't. What 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 happens when they won't or don't? How do you correct it human to human? How do you have a human civil court? Sure, under a theocracy for them, but but that can actually handle dealing with and what should be done. And imagine the people, like like let's say that there was the guy carrying the wood on the Sabbath. There's one story in the entire Old Testament of someone being stoned for breaking a Sabbath rule. Okay, but let's say even with that one, what if the people had advocated like Moses did for the people when he said, wait, if we cannot forgive this man his sin and we cannot rescue him and restore him, if, if what's needed is blot me out, what if the whole nation had said, how about we, we all give our lives up for eternity just so this person could be rescued? I mean, that would be an interesting story. <laughs> One, because we, you and I know we're dealing with, did this man just reject accidentally like was it one mistake he made was it you know and if you say it was two or three or is there a certain amount and then it becomes you know no what we're really talking about is the man's heart was the man who carried the wood on sabbath um even knowingly but under duress or de deception or confusion doing this or was it flat out belligerent? I do not want this God at all. Well, if so, then 
the results would be death. And so God kind of building into the system a way for the people to recognize um, death and the eminence of death from sin. And, and what are you doing to help your neighbor be saved from it? If he puts them in motion, like remember part of the rule was um, when Jesus said it, he said, Who, will anyone without sin go ahead and cast the first stone? Well, wait a minute, then why is anybody throwing stones, right? Uh, but on that day, they apparently didn't come up with that. God didn't say that. They didn't think of that. But what if they had thought of, um, you know, Lord, is there anything else we can do to rescue this person? And they have to have court and they have to discover and discuss, is this man guilty? I know, I think there's just been all these different various ways that God has put it in front of us to have to right but to see it in its fuller context and the whole story of this man that he had been in the wilderness for 40 almost 40 years he he had come across the red sea he saw that he saw the plagues he wasn't just some guy that forgot you're not supposed to carry wood on sabbath and besides that there was no purpose in carrying wood on sabbath there was no fires to start on sabbath in the temple uh, or anywhere near the temple even their own their own fires uh all, all you know they didn't have to carry the wood the wood would have been already prepped and ready to go on Friday. So just carrying it is like this thumb in his nose and rejection of God. And that's the context that's hard for people to sort of know and see in the story, to see that it's not just arbitrary harshness. But nonetheless, I think when we get done with it all, it will also have shown even that, even, even those rules did, did, all, did those rules and even having one stoning, did that really create true Sabbath keeping for those people? No, none of it accomplished that. Even, even later when Nehemiah comes, you know, back from Babylon and he shows up where they're supposed to be building on the temple again. And, and one of the things he did was implement these Sabbath laws. But, but none of that made it so that a few generations later when Jesus shows up, the people have real Sabbath. Right. So part of it is to look back and go like, like I look back and I go, huh, I wonder if did Nehemiah make that up? Did God actually tell me? It doesn't say in the story. It doesn't say God told Nehemiah, go tell the people these rules. Right. Now, you, you do get that in Deuteronomy, but with Nehemiah, you don't. So I'm wondering, I wonder about that story. Was that Nehemiah's idea about how to fix the problem? Because certainly the solution didn't work very well. But even if it was God, I think part of it is for God to bring about the understanding in the universe that that won't really create true obedience, loyalty, love. Um, it just doesn't work. So when you get to Jesus, then Jesus comes to say, okay, so we tried all those other things before, whether you call emergency measures or whatever. But now here's the only thing that will work. I'm going to offer it to you with free will and free choice. And I will not force anybody to accept or reject it. And I will tell you the results of rejecting it is death, not at God's hand, but at sin. And we see a very clear picture. And from there forward, we don't have to have that question anymore. And then we can turn around and look backwards and go, but that was the same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow back there. So it would have been the same Jesus, right? And we can go through that, sort of reevaluating those old stories. But, but see it with Jesus there doing it. Um, I think it's also very clear that after Joshua's time, there wasn't really a, a theocracy happening, even though, yeah, God set up king saul and set up king david god was he's always in charge even even now but is he the one really putting you know our leaders in to do what they're doing not necessarily so <clears throat> i think that theocracy we certainly have not had and we don't live under that and we're not 
required to stone people uh, for those same rules that were back there. That was a temporary thing. It was connected to a ceremonial law. Uh, I don't have any trouble with actually seeing the stoning part as part of the ceremonial law. <laughs> well, that's not a ceremony. Someone's dying. Well, yeah, in the context of God and eternal life, it's a ceremony. It's just a temporary thing. But that's that's my thoughts. That that opens another interesting thought just um, about ceremonial law in general because you know it's it's moral law and ceremonial law and all has been nailed to the cross, right? I mean, it's not about salvation in that sense. Uh, yet, even with the ceremonial law, you know, the lists of meats that are clean and unclean, you know, yeah, I... We, we pick and choose which ceremonial laws we want to still enforce. <laughs> yeah. Or we're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I don't ever think about the meats as being a salvation issue, but like a health code in the eyes. I don't know. But as long as we don't try to reestablish them as, as salvational laws, right? Right. I mean, there's some fun ones. For me, I, you probably heard me talk about this before. I, I sort of enjoy the one about the mold in the house and burning the house down. I think that's a great one. Um, <laughs> you know, if you owned an expensive house, you probably wouldn't like that plan very well. Um, I kind of like the idea of you know the Hawaiians they had it figured out when you live on an island that's a volcano you better not build much more than a grass hut because you're gonna have to rebuild it again soon <laughs> so in that context you know if they were dwelling in tents and they weren't building big expensive homes uh, it wouldn't be that big of a deal but it's an interesting sort of teaching tool to teach the idea of sin affecting the house meaning us our, our you know our house um, and the only thing that can fix it is a sacrificial lamb. Because that makes no context, no sense in the context of actual cleaning mold. Like if you're going to clean mold, you should use bleach or some other stuff, not blood. And yet, in, in the context of that ceremonial law, it was that the only thing that can fix it is the blood of the lamb. And if that can't fix it, you know, if, if they do the sacrifice and then they investigate the house again, and it's still got mold in it, then, then they had to burn the house down, start over. So I, I think it's a great explanation of justice and mercy, actually. <laughs> I mean, a great basis of uh, it's teaching that same idea, justice and mercy, um, context of sin and salvation. Uh, but again, if, if we were trying to implement that today, so that the pastor's got to go check your house, and if he finds it too dirty, he's going to give you a week to clean it up. And if you don't have it all cleaned up, then he's going to burn it down. And nobody would like that. <laughs> We'd rebel against that law. So, so there's there's some that are more easily seen as ceremonial only, and then some that are easy for us to fall in the pit of trying to, you know, draw from it whether we call it health principles or <laughs> ceremony or whatever, and try to draw it into a sort of a salvational thing. And then and those, those aren't, they don't belong there. Yeah. I don't think of them as salvational, but I still, you know, keep them like the, the meats one. And um, well, even, even science now will tell you, right. It's smarter to eat the ones on the list of the clean than the unclean. Yeah. We encountered some, when we were planting fruit trees, I happened to come across some that said we shouldn't pick the fruit for the first five years or something. And uh, I didn't really follow that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should have. I wondered if it yeah. made trees stronger, but I figured they probably were growing at the nursery for a while before I got them. <laughs> Ways to bend around those ceremonial laws. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I do have another, but it's getting kind of late. I could save it for another time. What is it? I just it's wanted to um, say thank you to Shady for the uh, cooking demonstration there. <laughs> Making sure we're all getting hungry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I'm hungry. <laughs> Good. It's, you're, it's you're, the, you're, it's, you go it's right the ahead and eat. Yeah, the whole Mary Martha battle, like. 
what can I do at the same time? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can be both. <laughs> um, yeah, Barb. So this one was related to the two altars when you just went over it Thursday night. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we we talk about Keen's <clears throat> Keen's altar and what if he had what if he had sacrificed the right symbol, but he still had the wrong heart. And, um, you know, it, even with the right symbol, there would be no fire if it was the wrong heart, you know, God, God wouldn't accept it if it, if it's not from the right heart. And then it made me think about Abel's altar, you know, so if Abel still had that right attitude and heart towards God, you know, repentance and thankful and uh, distrust, self-distrustful, but he had put the wrong symbol and he had put fruit, but he, but he didn't do it. Up. of any example in the Bible where they might not have had the details quite right, either in the theology or the knowledge or the <clears throat> ceremony, and yet they received a great blessing from God, uh, something that was significant enough to be like fire down from heaven. Any, well, exa any example of that? There is a king of Israel was it like Hezekiah or I don't know, somebody that, uh, and I don't remember all the details, but I remember him praying that God would overlook if they didn't have all the details right, but they were trying to come back to him or whatever. Okay. Do you remember? I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. If I, uh, I don't remember the enough details on that one, uh, but that would, that could be an example. What else? Any, any others? Um, what about when Moses came down and they had already had a, a golden calf? Like, was there something that happened then? Um, Did he show his disappointment then? Uh, but yes. Like, but he didn't just like immediately off them all. <laughs> well, yeah. So, so to the point, did he destroy them? No. Um, he worked at rescuing them. Um, that one, though, is the context there would be the specific instructions had been given, then not followed, and then corrected. I was think, trying to think of one more along the line where, well, that I guess could still fit because Cain had instruction, but then chose different symbol. Um, I was just trying to think of, of some that would be where they didn't get the details all right or didn't know it. Um, he, here's uh, one I could think of. Um, you know, the rules to transport the ark was that it was supposed to be carried on the shoulders of 12 men. So three men on each corner with a pole that kind of went through like a, a carrying pole. And so you'd have 12 men and they were supposed to carry it up on their shoulder like this, you know, so like pallbearers, but up here, not down. Um, and that's how the ark was always moved, whether it was in battle with Israel or just moved as they moved the, the camp from place to place. So then the, the Philistines, I believe it was the Philistines or the Amalekites, anyway, one of that group, they conquered Israel and they, they stole the ark and they took it. Um, and, and they didn't know the rules about putting a veil over it. Uh, they didn't know the rules, so they put it in their heathen temple right next to their god, right? So they thought, well, now we have two gods. Uh, <clears throat> so ceremonially, they were they were off track. They didn't have the rules right, didn't have the ceremonies right. Uh, they weren't even worshiping the right god. So God then, instead of killing them, though, uh, he like Uzzah, who died touching the ark, 
he uses it as an opportunity to teach them the difference between their God, which was nothing but stone, versus him. Um, you know this story, Shady? No, no, I don't. So, so some of the details, just because it's fun, is so the the Philistines or whichever can't remember now which group got it. They put it in their temple. I think the temple's name, uh, their god's name was Dagon, and they put it in their temple. And the next morning, the priest came in, meaning the heathen priest to the heathen gods. They came in, and there's the ark of Jehovah that they put there, and next to it is their big statue of Dagon, and it's laid down on its face like it fell fell over can't get up can't get itself up it's just kind of stuck right so the priest they go oh this is not good so uh symbolically even it's got the the their god sort of bowing down to to the ark <laughs> so then they put it back up and they they uh well we're going to fix this so they put it back up and the next morning sure enough it was knocked out, knocked over again. They didn't understand why. Also, along with this, there was a plague that started to go through their country. They were getting sick. And so they decided that, hey, this is not good. So they're going to put the ark on a cart, and they're going to take two oxen that just had calves, and they're going to tie the calves up, and they're going to take the, the, the mommy oxes, you know, oxen, whatever, and, and going to just turn them loose. And if this is the true living God, then he can take care of what happens with those ox and where they go. And sure enough, they make a straight line, even though their calves are over there tied up and bawling and calling for mom, you know, how cows normally would do. Well, these ones, they just go straight, straight down the road to take this ark back where it belongs. Uh, so this was all sort of God showing the not believer people about who he was and the ceremonies weren't right ceremonies were wrong uh the, the the religion was wrong and yet god is still working at trying to help and rescue them uh did he did he uh bring fire down from heaven for them physically no but he did he did knock their god over <laughs> on its face so i think there's there's a few others that we could bring up as kind of content i found the i found the one that i was looking for okay go ahead um it's second chronicles 30 chapter 30 okay and basically king hezekiah wrote letters to all over basically israel and judah and told them to come they're gonna they wanted to um get rid of some of the they wanted they wanted to celebrate Passover but it's like they didn't know how and they were just rediscovering it or something and so he sent these runners to go invite everybody and then um they had they did uh they removed pagan altars and some of the idols and things that they had been worshiping and then uh, verse 18 well, we'll start in 17. Since many of the people had not purified themselves, the Levites had to slaughter their Passover, Passover lamb for them to set them apart for the Lord. Most 